Well, I'm Paul Clarice chatting with you, um, author of uh, History of the Falmouth Road Race, Running Cape Cod, and also a few of uh, the Boston Marathon books as well. Um, if, if you want to buy any of them, I can sign them for you, hang out afterwards, uh, answer any questions. I'll take you through the course, get you some anecdotes and stories, and if you have any questions, well, we've already been doing that, but if you have any questions, just, just raise your hand during, as I'm talking, so I don't mind. Um, so here's Tommy Leonard right here. Hello. Everyone knows the late, great Tommy Leonard. Uh, back in 1972, in September, during the Olympics, uh, Tommy Leonard was working uh, at the Brothers Four, which is no longer uh, here at the top of Falmouth Heights. He went from working at the Elliott Lounge in Boston, which is also no longer there. <laughs> uh, it, it used to be in the Elliott Hotel, uh, about a mile from the finish line of the Boston Marathon near the Harvard Club. So he would work there as a bartender, and then he would work in the summers at Brothers Four, and he knew the Cape a lot. And he loved running, loved the marathon, ran several of them. Um, the Elliott Lounge was a great running bar. He had like the uh, long jump record was painted on the floor, the high jump record was painted on the wall, he had photos of runners, it was great. Everyone went there after the race. So he loved the Olympics. And when he's watching Frank Shaw to win the marathon while he's working at their Brothers Four, he sort of stopped serving beers and started giving commentary because it was on TV, which no one seemed to mind. Even the owner said, that's okay. <laughs> and Frank Shaw to won, the first American to win the marathon since uh, 1908. So this is a big deal on TV. Uh, Frank Short, who lives in Falmouth now, was familiar with the area anyway. He would come to the Cape a lot. So we kind of we knew him, but you know, um, parts of the running community started to get to know who he was because he was really good. He competed against Rod Dixon, Steve Prefontaine. I mean, everyone really knew, knew him. So when he won the gold, this was great. And Tommy goes, wouldn't it be great to have Frank Short run here in Falmouth? And everyone laughed at him. He said, and he goes, I just use that as, as fuel. It, it, it'll come. So that was September 1972. So within the year, he bumped into Rich and Kathy Sherman and John and Lucia Carroll uh, in Falmouth. Uh, John was the uh, coach for the high school girls uh, at Falmouth, and Rich was at the um, recreation department. And they got to know each other a little bit over the years. Uh, and at the time, girls couldn't compete after the season ended. Um, Title IX just it was signed in June of 72. Um, but you know, it takes a while for things, equal, equal federal funding for boys and girls sports. Um, the AAU, the Amateur Athletic Union, which the governing body of all races in the country, Boston, <coughs> Falmouth, whatever, didn't allow women to run. Um, so it started the running boom when Frank Short won in 1972, and little things like that started to build. So they wanted to get, the, these girls were good in Falmouth, but they couldn't compete. So what John did is he created the Falmouth Track Club and put the girls in to represent the club. So now they could compete, but they were competing against women, older females. But they needed fundraising to afford that. So Tommy, who in Boston, would do little bar-to-bar -bar races with Eddie Doyle, who everyone knows from Falmouth with the Falmouth Walk that he created with Tommy. Uh, Eddie was at the Bowling Finch Pub, which is now Cheers, in Boston. Um, so what they would do is when they needed like, a quick fundraiser, I remember someone got in a motorcycle accident uh, who used to go to the Elliott and uh, Bull and Finch a lot, so to raise money for him. They did a race between the bars, which is like maybe a mile or two in Boston. Or they would have little parades or just something. So a bar to bar race is something Tommy always knew of. So he thought of it here. He goes, well, let's do this. We'll, we'll, do a, we'll, go from, we'll go from a Captain Kid, because I go there a lot, to the Brothers Four, which I work. And he runs and trains a lot as well. They didn't measure it yet. So he goes, that's a good one. We'll do that. <laughs> Then they measure it, it's about seven miles. Actually from door to door, John Carroll told me, it's 6.999 miles from the door of the Captain Kid to the door of the Brothers Four. Over the years, it became 7.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, depending. I was asking Rich and John and Tommy about that, and he goes, well, it depends whose car measured it, <laughs> when you looked at the odometer, when you started, when you stopped. Uh, 2003, they finally got it certified by USA Track and Field to seven miles. But prior to that, you, you kind of wrote down seven plus on your running log. Um, so he did that. So Tommy went to different stores, got little prizes and a little shopping cart, went from door to door to look around. Uh, he created a nice uh, little t-shirt here. Um, he called it the marathon because he wanted to popularize, popularize Frank Shaw to win the Olympic marathon. And also with, um, back then, road races were actually referring to uh, automobiles, motorcycle, Indy 500. That was a road race. 
back then. Uh, if you look at the old programs, it'll say Indy 500 road race, which is kind of interesting. So that's another reason why you put the word marathon, just to sort of take advantage of that. But you put a runner there, so that was pretty good. <laughs> um, so he had 92 runners. Um, this will you know, get you back if you remember how this was. This was the Brothers Four at the top of Falmouth Heights uh, with an old fire call box. <laughs> Um, this is no longer here, so what uh, runners do is you run right by here and you go down the hill to the finish line to kind of give you a perspective of uh, what the brother's for. Great photo from Charlie Rogers, uh, Bill Rogers' brother, um, took this one. Um, so all, 92 runners, they all kind of fit in the Captain Kid because it was raining <laughs> on April 15th, 1973, uh, which was Tommy Leonard's 40th birthday, uh, Wednesday afternoon. Uh, we didn't know better back then. <laughs> Let's have a race in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week. Uh, everyone's but, on vacation. Yeah, everyone's on vacation. Why not? Everyone's from Woods Hole, Falmouth, primarily. Um, so I remember John Carroll saying everyone was inside because it was raining. And when you came out, I basically told everyone, okay, if everyone, you're all from the Cape. You know where you're going. Just go down here, go by the lighthouse, the harbor, surf, the whole thing. You know where you're going. So that's what everyone did. Unfortunately, the leader, this gentleman, Dave Dew, was from Michigan. He didn't know where he was going. <laughs> He's like, I don't know. Um, he had a friend of his whose uncle, I believe, was working at Woods Hole, so he came to visit. And on their way here, they picked up a hitchhiker who told them about this race. And Dave Duba was a runner at Central Michigan. So he goes, oh, I guess I'll run this race. You know, why not? So he was one of them, uh, one of the few from out of state to run it. Uh, the gentleman in second place is Pat Doherty, a uh, uh, future Greater Boston Track Club runner of the Doherty brothers. So yeah, he's running from Michigan, not knowing where he's going. This is the race in the rain. It is the rain, as we were talking earlier. It's either hot and ugly or rainy, other than a couple of good days. So it's usually like that. Um, so Dave Duba won, um, and Jenny Tuthill won, first female. And he remembers, Dave Duba remembers when he finished. He loved it, like when you saw the Brothers Four photo. You cross the finish line, you walk like eight feet, and you're in a bar. <laughs> He goes, come on, I'd love to have the finish line in the bar. What better, what better way to do this? So when he finished, he remembered seeing this older gentleman, gray hair with a Hawaiian shirt, jitterbugging on the dance floor at their brother's four. And he's like, I'm so tired. Well, who's this guy? And it was Johnny Kelly, who we all know from around here. He goes, this guy's like double my age, and he's, like, he's putting me to shame. He goes, well, yeah, he's kind of like a you know, double Olympian. You know, he's one boss in this. And they go, oh, okay. <laughs> But still, it was quite a sight, he said, to see this, you know, somebody like that. Um, so that was 1973, 92 runners. So they figured maybe we'll get 100, maybe 200 for 1974, which is this year here. Um, the Brothers Four is like right about here. That's a nice little crowd. Uh, yeah. So spectator, I mean, it really, again, the running boom was just starting. So a lot of different things. They had some, um, some books were coming out about the benefits of running. Again, you had the Frank Shore, the Title IX. Bill Rogers locally was doing pretty well in the Boston Marathon. People were coming out and running and knowing about the sport. There were races before that. The Cape had some good races prior to the running boom. But it was now starting to be a, a bigger interest, you know, more organized. Uh, as you can see from the spectators here at Falmouth Heights, right before the Brothers Four. So they invited Marty LaCorey, who this gentleman is right here, who was one of our great Olympians. And a couple of years before this race, in 68, he became the third American high schooler to run a sub four minute mile. Uh, he was great on the track circuit, just one of our finest athletes. Uh, and shorter distance, you know, mile compared to the seven mile race. But it brought, brought great attention to this race. And they got several hundred runners and spectators. Um, and he was thinking, they were telling, look, you're, you're a real Olympian, great miler. You should do pretty well in this race. You probably could win it. And Bill Rogers, who's running it, said, wait a second. I don't, I'm not going to get beat by a miler. <laughs> I train, I do Boston Marathon, I run out. He goes, nah, I'm not going to do it. And sure enough, Bill Rogers won and Mario LaCour. He came in second place. As you can see, he's about to come in second place here. Um, but the Greater Boston Track Club, which actually formed at Boston College the same week the Falmouth Road Race was created, unrelated, but interestingly the same week, uh, Jack McDonald uh, created it, uh, BC athlete for post-collegiate athletes to continue running, real good athletes. And Bill Squires became the first coach. Well, the members of the Greater Boston Track Club included in the 70s and 80s especially, Bill Rogers, Greg Meyer, Alberto Salazar, Bob Hall, the wheelchair champion. All those, basically, all the Americans who won Boston in the 70s and 80s were Greater Boston Track Club guys. Same with Falmouth. 
So Tommy Leonard, who knew all these guys, said, hey, can you bring some of these guys to run the second year in 74? We're moving the race to Sunday. Um, <laughs> Tommy promised we'll have women with bikinis handing out water at every water stop. <laughs> It'll be great. And Bill Rogers goes, I'm still waiting for the women with bikinis. I didn't see them. So Tommy goes, I'm an idea man. I got great ideas. <laughs> um, so they did. The Coach Squires brought a lot, all these great, great Boston Track Club guys in 74, which upped the um, competition. Not that the first year was a fun run, but you didn't really have the elite athlete level. It was a running boom. You just started. You, know, you didn't know it was a running boom at the time, but that was just how it started. So this is just the second year that something like this ha happened. And you have all this attention um, from runners, from spectators, from amateur runners. This is from 1976, but it shows you um, in 1975, uh, just the third year, Frank Shorter finally became, he's the second from the left, finally ran Falmouth. This is just the third year, and you have the Olympic champion running, in addition to all these greats from Greater Boston Track Club. So in August of 75, Bill Rogers had just won Boston Marathon in April. Frank Shorter's coming to run. So you have the good battle between those two, which they did for several years. That really pushed the interest of this race. Not only do you have a great course, great community, great people around here, now you have a, you're starting to get some pretty good athletes. So now you have a lot of different pockets of interest in here. Now this, for 1976, um, the gentleman on the far left is Tom Dedarian with the beard, number 841. He's the Greater Boston Track Club coach now. Uh, back then, he was a real good top runner. Uh, if you ever see the photos of the Boston Marathon of the female winners and then the female leaders, he was usually, he ran fast enough he's around that group of the elite women. So if you, if you sort of recognize them, that's who he was. The gentleman next to him uh, is Frank Shorter with a white t-shirt, no bib number. Uh, interestingly, he's wearing a McSorley's Ale t-shirt who paid him to wear it. <laughs> so he didn't want to block the logo with the bib number. So one of the first paid athletes. <laughs> Um, and to actually get him here, Bill Crowley, who owned Captain Kidd, paid his fee to g come here because Frank would uh, go to Europe around this time and do track um, meets there and get paid. Um, each athlete had a circuit that they would go seasonally, still like that. But he, when he was contacted by Bill Rogers and Tommy, he said, I'd rather run here from Colorado, I'd rather save the travel, but you know, I, I, I get paid. So the race couldn't pay him because then he'd lose his amateur status for the 76 Olympics. So I remember interviewing uh, Bill's widow, uh, Maggie, for the book. And she said, you know, we kept the canceled checks. So if the Olympic Committee or someone wanted to make sure he wasn't paid by the race, we had proof. And, and this was like decades later. And I said, do you still have them? She says, oh, yeah, I got them. I said, well, I, I think Frank's OK now. <laughs> she goes, no, no, I still got them. I go, no, that's fine. You can keep them. But I, I think statute of limitations is OK. <laughs> um, the gentleman behind Frank Shorter in the white hat and the beard is Andrew Burfoot, who won Boston in 1968. The gentleman behind him in the blue singlet is Alberto Salazar, who you know has won Falmouth a number of times, Boston, um, New York. Coming back to the front row, uh, the gentleman in between Frank Shorter, uh, shorter than Frank Shorter, uh, next to him is Bob Hodge, another great Boston track club runner, uh, top five, top ten guy at Boston and Falmouth. Um, he's won Mount Washington seven, eight times, I think. The 7.6 mile race that goes up the mountain. Um, grueling race. Uh, next to him, great Boston guy, number zero is Vin Fleming, another top 10 Boston guy. Next to him, another great Boston track club guy is Randy Thomas, who just retired from Boston College after decades of uh, being the coach of uh, cross country and track and everything. Uh, and Bill Rogers on the right there, uh, right here. So you had a great, starting, this is 76, so you had a great field within the first few years of this race. So you had a lot of people interested in this race, um, whether you were an elite athlete, an amateur athlete, or just a spectator. This is taken 77, 78. Uh, this is Bob Hall, I referred to, the wheelchair athlete. Uh, you can see the banner way back there with the Captain Kid. Um, this is a really neat photo from the Historical Society. Bob Hall basically started the wheelchair category uh, in the Boston Marathon and Falmouth. Uh, he was a student, talk about how things are connected. Bill Squires, the coach of the Greater Boston Track Club, also taught at uh, Boston State College, which became UMass Boston later. Uh, one of his students was Bob Hall. And Bob was a real good uh, wheelchair athlete, a uh, national miler. But he wanted to do the Boston Marathon, so he asked Coach. And, and women would ask coaches before women were allowed to run. Uh, coach Squires didn't care who you were. You want to run? I'll try. Come on. I'll. He loved the sport. 
So Bob Hall, wheelchair athlete, he goes, I want to do Boston. He goes, oh, all right. I'll give you training. I'll, 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 we'll do it. Uh, but there was no category. So he contacted the BEA because he knew a lot of the people there. And they said, all right, uh, if, if he finishes under three hours, he'll be considered an official finisher, first one. And sure enough, he trained, did it in two hours and 58 minutes, became the first official wheelchair entrant finisher. Basically, that's it. From, what you, from everything that, that point on started with him that you see now with all these aerodynamic wheelchairs. I mean, you'll see these are the hospital wheelchairs, these vertical, that they're going through these courses, which is just, I don't know. How do you, do, how do you maneuver a, a hallway <laughs> with those things? Um, so then when Falmouth came around, he goes, I'd like to do Falmouth. So he contacted the race, and they go, yeah, come on over. Same thing. So he basically started. Nobody was against it, per se, but no one really made the effort or started it before Bob did. So it, it all comes down to him doing that. And he won Falmouth, won Boston a number of times, so it's really uh, marvelous that he did that. I'm so glad he gives credit, too. Joe Branch Samuelson, uh, first lady of Falmouth, has won it six times. Uh, it's funny, when I interviewed her for the book, S some of the wins, she's like, I can't, I can't remember, they sort of blend in. <laughs> because she was so strong and dominant a runner, she just would break free and, and just be her. Like she did in 80, the 84 Olympics, the, the inaugural women's marathon. Within a couple miles, she just broke free. And she was just doing that because that's how she trained at home in Maine. She ran alone, she, you know, which is tough to run alone and push yourself. But she was used to that. Usually it's, it's easy to chase someone, easy to have someone near you to push you. She did it on her own. So when it happened in Falmouth and Boston a couple of times in the Olympics, she was like, I'd rather have somebody with me, but all right, I'll do it. And she did that in Falmouth a number of times, actually. Um, back to the captain kid. I love seeing people on the roofs. <laughs> I don't know if the fire marshal did, but I thought it was cool. Um, this is 78, 79, I think. Uh, Perrier right there with the banner. Falmouth was actually the first race that they sponsored oh. nationwide. They were thinking about it back then. No one really sponsored races. When, when they were just starting, no one really knew. But it dawned on them, like, wait, there's thousands and hundreds of people in the same spot at the same time. We've got to get our logo somewhere. Um, I remember Tommy Leonard had a shuttle bus early on, and some cigarette companies wanted to put their logo, and he goes, no, nah, I don't want cigarette companies. So he was aware of that. So Fred LeBeau, who was one of the race directors of the New York City Marathon, came up and was talking to Tommy Leonard and said, you know, Perry contacted us. They, they want to sponsor New York. Well, you should give them a call. They're, they want to get into doing that. So Tommy goes, oh, great. And he, he always told the story. He put on his best suit, which had, like, pizza pie stains on it. You know, the tie's crooked. You know, he's balding, he said, and it was so hot, my forehead's red. And, you know, I get down to New York where the, the headquarters, the New England area of Perrier was. And I'm talking to the president, you know, flailing my arms, Falmouth is beautiful, you're going to love it, the coast, and road racing, he's just doing that. And I had interviewed the president for the book, and he said, by halfway through, I just stopped Tommy and said, Tommy, you got us. Here's a check for like five or $6,000. He said, yeah, we'll sponsor. And Tommy goes, well, I'm not finished. I, I got more to say. He goes, you got it. And, and I told him, I, go, what, I asked the president, I said, what got your attention? He said, here's a guy who just loves this community and loves this race and loves running so much to see this energy. I, go, I didn't even see this place, and I knew it was worth it. And he brought a bunch of people, Perrier did, to do the next couple of races to run. He ended up buying a house here. He fell in love with the cave, you know, which he ain't the only one, right? <laughs> you know, Tommy uh, you know, brought people into this community this way. So just his enthusiasm alone. So I thought that was kind of neat with him just, you know, we're just thinking 79 was the first year that... Perrier, I think, was 77. The photo was 79. 79 when we started the 23 years. Of That's when you started it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that, they, would, they got the banner and they just changed the year, the number at the end. It was smart. Instead of having a new banner. <laughs> so that was pretty good. Um, this is 78. The Brothers Four, you can see sort of on the top left corner there. Um, after the second year, they moved the finish line to roughly where it is now, give or take. Um, the race just started to grow. Like, like most races within the country during the running boom, races were just growing by hundreds and some by thousands. Um, by 1980, the, the Falmouth Road Race had to stop and say, wait, we need a lottery. I think it was up to six, seven, eight thousand, something around there, four or five. I can't remember the, it just grew so much. And that was just how it was nationwide. It, it just, it was, the interest just exploded. Um, this is interesting in 78, the first gentleman is Bob Hodge, I showed you earlier. The red shirt is Greg Meyer. The next gentleman is Alberto Salazar. Uh, this is the year that Salazar almost died in Falmouth. He always hear uh, myth or legend about that. So I interviewed 
Alberto for the book. And what happened was he was a great Boston track club guy out of Wayland High School. He was young, I think he was 21, 22 at this time, and he would look up to the Bill Rogers, I mean, these guys who have won Boston, and you know, you, you compete, you train together, you're friends, but when the gun goes off, you want to win. Then you have a beer afterwards. That's with any sport, really. So at uh, Woods Hole near Captain Kidd, everyone's sort of looking at Bill Rogers, see what Bill's doing. So Coach Squires, who's coaching all the greater Boston guys, sort of saw that and, and said to Bill Rogers, unbeknownst to Bill, why don't you go behind the building, continue hydrating, stretch, you know, basically just want to get him out of the view of the other runners. You know, you want to get as much edge as you can. So the gun went off and Alberto goes the first mile, Bill Rogers didn't take water, so I didn't take water. He didn't, why would I? Not knowing Bill Rogers is fully hydrated, Alberto's not. Second mile, same thing, and they're really pushing hard. It was a real hot, really gross day in 78. Uh, Dan Dillon, one of our great uh, cross country guys, says, I, I remember the first mile, and then I remember the ambulance at the finish. I don't remember the middle. <laughs> and he's like, thanks for bringing it up. Uh, funny guy, he's out of Providence College. Uh, married, to, married to Patty uh, Dillon, they're in Connecticut now. So um, he was saying around the f four miles or so, three and a half, four miles, I think it was Salazar, Bill Rogers, maybe someone else. <clears throat> and Al was just off Bill Rogers' shoulder and he's trying to catch him because they train together enough that they know their abilities and they, get, they will get to a point in a race that somebody will then take that next step. But you, he, you know within your training, but he goes, I couldn't catch him. And I was confused about that. And I go, what do you mean you were confused? He goes, well, I know now I wasn't getting blood to my brain. I was in the midst of the heat stroke. But at the time, I'm young, I couldn't do this, so what do I do? I push harder. Right? right? That's what you do when you're like that. And he goes, I still to this day I can't remember the last couple miles of the race, he said, to this day. I mean, you went for the book. When he got to the top of the hill, I think he was in fifth or sixth. He ended up being in tenth. He got passed by like four or five guys just within this hill, Greg Meyer being the last one to pass him. And they all know each other. You know, uh, Bob Hodge, Greg, and Al are all in Greater Boston Track Club. Bill Rogers won this year, also Greater Boston. And you can tell how Al is just struggling. His head's up and he's just not doing well. When he gets to the finish line, he collapses. And he has a 108 degree body temperature. Oh my God. And he's combative. He's just wailing his arms, which is a sign of heat stroke. Now, the medical at Falmouth was excellent from the first race on. I researched the medical journal about a year before this, year or two before this race, that talked about the benefits of cooling down uh, an overheated body, like in a bath of ice or something they would do in hospitals to bring your body temperature down. Well, these guys were doing is, you know, they, they're from the Cape. You know the heat in August, so they just, they just apply their knowledge, this before the medical journal, to this race for other people. So when Salazar was coming around, Dr. Crago and them noticed this guy isn't doing well. So right at the finish line, when he collapsed, they grabbed him, they threw him in the, the kiddie pool of ice to bring his body temperature down. And he's, he's still combative, and his father, Jose, said, you know, take him to the hospital, and they, we can't. He'll, he'll die before he gets there. What's the hospital, two miles maybe from here? He goes, we gotta bring his temperature down, and stabilize him which they did. Jose put uh, two tongue depressors together at like the sign of a cross so Al could look at something to focus him. They gave him his last rites. It was just a very bad scene. They finally stabilized him, brought him to the hospital, and he got tons of liters of fluids. The, uh, because he was so uh, ahead of everybody, like in top 10, I think it was top 10 or 15 and 20 get awards. It was several hours before the award ceremony on the field that he recouped enough that he went to the award ceremony. And Charlie Rogers, who took this photo, gave me another photo for the book that shows um, Alberto walking up to the stage with a gauze pad, pad where he got the IV, walking up the steps to get his 10th place award, whatever it was. And the, he could have taken that off. Yeah. But it was like a badge of honor, like, this didn't kill me this year, guys. Look out for me. And sure enough, in the next several years, he, he just took control of, of running. He, he ran in New York, Boston. He won Falmouth with course records. It was foreshadowing. Um, but he did say later on, this race and the 1982 Boston, the duel in the sun that he ran with Dick Beardsley, they really pushed each other hard on a hot day in Patriots Day. Those two races primarily really affected his immune system, and he had never been the same since, just physically, just really racked him. But he's, I remember asking Bill Rogers, who, like I said, he won this race, but he didn't know what was going on behind him. He goes, that's how we ran. It was dicey. We pushed ourselves hard. He goes, that's just what we did whether you're a teammate or not, and at the end you'd have your beer and enjoy. But I didn't know this happened to Al behind me, 10 spots behind. Um, it was dangerous. 
So as you can see, this is late 70s, the interest of this race is just growing and growing and growing. Um, the finish line is right here. And if you look on the roof of the restaurant, uh, I forget the name of the restaurant back then, they have a couple of names since then. Uh, there are people on the roof and they're actually given times <laughs> to the runners back then. Before the chip, before bib numbers have the electronic chip, there was a, a bunch of ways, not just Falmouth, like with Boston, with everything, to actually get your time. Um, I remember when I ran cross country in high school, when you crossed the finish line, the official had a tongue depressor with the finish uh, place, and you'd, you'd grab the tongue depressor. If you came in fifth, it would say five on it. And there'd be an official there who was clicking the times. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the race, they would get the tongue depressors back, match the tongue depressors with your name with those times, and that's how they would get the results, and they would write it down. Um, there's so many runners sometimes in Falmouth, they had volunteers with tape recorders just like reading the numbers as they're coming in. And then someone would be clicking whenever someone crossed the line, they'd click on their time and they'd match that up. So they had someone with a walkie-talkie talking to somebody in the roof and every five minutes or so, just so the runners have an idea what they're running, there's like four sandwich boards on the roof with numbers and the volunteer would just flip over number 35. <laughs> and then someone would say, hey, we're at 40 minutes now. 40. And they would just flip this over. So that's what those people are on the roof. <laughs> Until one year, there was a little fire in the back, and no one wanted to go up there again. There was like a little fire, not a big one, but enough to like, wait a second, I don't want to fall down. <laughs> but that's how it was back then. It was very archaic getting those things. So with all these things, yeah, they built this every year for the media. This is, this is local and um, global media. I remember talking to some of the people on there, Bill Higgins, the uh, longtime Cape Cod Times sports guy, is, on, is here somewhere. He goes, I don't know where I am. I think I'm on that side. <laughs> but he would remember this from people from around the country because people really started getting interested in this race, not just the Cape Cod people, but people from all around. And they would put these little two-by-fours up, and he goes, they, we were just packed in there on little elevated, elevated uh, tiers up there. And he said, one year we heard on the back like a grinding sound, <clears throat> and then all of a sudden we heard a pop. And one of these tires, the whole tire, the wheel, the hub, everything broke off and rolled down and almost hit the leader and ended in someone's front yard. <laughs> and it still had enough tires that it finished, but you know, uh, Tony Revis is also here somewhere who does the commentating, if you watch on TV in Boston as well, said, I don't know how this thing got insured. And, I said, and I'm like, well, what makes you think it was? Said, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, they had to take the turns real slow. Uh, sometimes the leaders would pass it and like, hold their hand against the two by fours as they're running by it. You know, but that's how things were in those days. Again, not just with Falmouth. You had to react. All of a sudden you had a couple thousand runners. Oh, how do we have to do this? I mean, Bill Doherty remembers the first year the finish line was a clothesline from the clothespin. <laughs> you know, with a couple of orange cones, maybe a, one cop, because that was about it. So as races grew, you had to respond to that. You know, until, uh, like I said, until around 1980, um, for Falmouth, they said, okay, wait a second, we got, we've got, we been reacting every year, let's, let's be proactive. And that was indicative of the whole country with races. They just kept growing and growing, and you just responded to what happened the previous year, hoping you were prepared for the following year, and then you're like, oh, wait a second, we have to do something. Um, this I always put in for, for everyone over here so that you, you see what's on the other side. <laughs> but with all the interest came traffic, right? So that's kind of funny. I always get laughs when I put this up. Unless you're in it. <laughs> then you're not laughing. But then you had Expo. This is the old Gus Canty Center. Uh, the Expo now is at the, the uh, high school. Um, yeah, this is the old one before they, they, they redid it nicely. But you'd get your, your shirt, you'd get vendors. They didn't really have vendors. In the first couple of years, maybe someone was selling shirts on the sidewalk. You can get your number in the trunk of the car at Woods Hole. You know, same with the early Boston Marathons. Even up until the 70s, you could just drive up to the high school, walk in the morning of the race, get your number and go to the start. Can't do that now, but, um, but that's how things were. And then you start to grow, say, well look, now we have all these vendors who are interested, we gotta put them somewhere. Let's get some organization here, which is kind of neat. But then there came, <laughs> you know, I don't know the percentage, but Woods Hole has, what, 500 residents under, what is it, what is it now? Uh, I remember what it was in 73 the first year. Um, that's more than 500. <laughs> so you get the finish line, he, uh, the starting line here at Captain Kidd, and then it goes up all the way over. That's a great shot. Yeah, isn't that nice? And this is uh, the 90s, mid-90s, so add another couple thousand at the that's end. Yeah? 
Yeah. Um, I remember taking the ferry a couple of years that would drop you off here from Falmouth. That was pretty neat. Oh, yeah. You could go at, at, off Scanlon, get on the ferry, and then it would take you to um, right here is where they drop you off. The buses take you that way. But it was neat a couple of years to do that just from a different view because mm -hmm. you can see the whole course from that way. Yeah, it was really neat. Wish they could still do that. Uh, a lot of things changed after the bombing nationwide. It's things you just couldn't do anymore. Oh, yeah. This is the bird's eye, well, a bird's eye view, runner's eye view. And there's the um, yeah. starting line right there, the Captain Kidd, gives you an idea of what it looks like from the ground. So you got the bird's eye view, and I got the... <laughs> you remember this quite a few times, right? Um, like, again, before the chip, you know, say you're back here and the gun goes off, and say it takes you five, eight minutes to get to the yeah. starting line, you're five, eight minutes into your time. Yeah. Um, Doesn't matter, you know. Um, right. Same with Boston. Although what Boston used to do, I don't know if Falmouth did this, in the Boston Marathon, and I even remember this, my first Boston was in 1990. You could be 12th, 14th corral, so the gun went off at noon, it could take you 11 minutes to cross the starting line, you're 11 minutes into your race. But the BAA would sort of calculate how long it took you based on your corral, and you get a little index card in the mail that you can deduct a certain amount of minutes, which I thought was pretty good. I wish you could still do that. <laughs> But once you got the chip, once you got um, chip technology, which basically started, Boston Marathon did it in 1996. There's a little chip you put on your shoelaces because of the 100th. So with 38,000 runners, when you physically cross the starting line and there was a mat of a wire underneath, your time started. Yeah. So that was good. So if it took you, you know, if it was 20 past 12, by the time you cross the starting line, you start, which was nice. Same thing with Falmouth. When they, they renamed, this is the time and then the start line, uh, they renamed the name of Tommy, which was nice. So a lot of races did this. You have the elite women, they go off just by themselves. That way they can compete and see each other. You know, in the old days, in, in any race, men and women went off at the same time, and the elite women really had to look through all the men to see, oh, there's someone ahead of me. And it was kind of tough. I felt bad like, for them for that. This way, the women have their own race. They see who's in front. They're at their own speed. They know who they, should, they can beat, that kind of thing. And then the elite men would go off. And then Falmouth, like a lot of other races, have staggered starts or pulse, however, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Basically, about 1,000 runners go every couple minutes, yeah. Yeah. which spreads it out. And again, with the chip technology, you could be eight corrals, 10 corrals back, and your time doesn't start until you cross the starting line. So that chip technology really opened it up and, and freed up courses much better. That, and you don't get all clogged up. It actually, it actually flows, flows nicer. Uh, there's Tommy Leonard right here, Dave McGilvery. That's the plaque outside the Captain Kid is still there when they dedicated this um, to, to the Tommy Leonard start line to him, which was nice. I'm glad Tommy got a lot of recognition while he was alive to enjoy it, to know he was appreciated. Uh, I mean, I think he knew he was appreciated, but it's nice to see it from the community, whether it was Boston Marathon with the bridge named after him, or Tommy with, with the garden here and, and the start line and things like that. So it's nice, instead of doing it now, after, after he died, it was nice that he saw that appreciation. Uh, this is a photo we were talking about, the first mile. I won't take you through the whole course, but the first mile is awesome. You know, I mean, you've been training for however many months, you know, you've annoyed your family for however many months and everything, and you're finally here, and the, the first mile mark is right about where the Nopska Point light, right around the bend is the first mile mark. Um, you can fry if it's hot. Uh, there's no protection, as you see, and this is you hooking in to the uh, heat bath <laughs> a little bit with the tree lines. Um, but it's, it's well worth it because this is what you see a lot is that lighthouse. So you really look forward to that. And the flag at the finish line, this is from 1987, this photo actually. In 87, this flag, um, Mount Rushmore, had a nice uh, thing that they were doing nationwide. That the, the flag that flew over Mount Rushmore, they would bring throughout the country. If you wanted it at your event, let them know. So Jim Garris, a Vietnam veteran from the Cape, from Falmouth, contacted them and said, yeah, we get the Falmouth Road Race, Can you, we'd love it. So this is the Mount Rushmore flag in 1987. The first few years that Falmouth had done, did the flag, it was the Mount Rushmore flag. It's now not the Mount Rushmore flag anymore, but they maintain their tradition. You know, it's like f 300 pounds, 4,000 square, I think it's huge wow. and heavy. And you see the volunteers, it's all rolled up and it's like, they're holding it like this so it doesn't touch yeah. the ground. And the crane lifts it up in the morning but you see them all holding it like this. It's really neat when they do that. Um, but that's how it started in 87 from Jim Garrett's, which is really neat to, to see that. Um, it's, it's just a real neat thing. 
This is 1991, Hurricane oh, Bob, for y'all, all, uh, all of you. Actually, this was that night. Um, that's John Carroll's car, one of the race directors. It was so close to the race that they didn't clean up everything at the end. They saw it coming. This is Sunday of the race in 1991. So they put everything on the ball field in like a big um, pile, put trucks around it, and they all went home. It was coming that, it came within that evening. If it came within 20 hours earlier, 24 hours, it would have been during the race. And it actually pushed, this is Surf Drive, it pushed the course, you've seen all the photos, the homes it was moving. It took a while to get the course back, almost a year. Yeah. Because, you know, on your list of things to do, you, the, the cape lost power. Yeah, so you want to get the, the, the important things first, get your power back, stuff like that. So it took a while for the engineers to redo Surf Drive for the course. Um, it was close enough that they actually were starting to plan a little little U-turns around it for a new course in this area. It was getting that close to the following year, 92's race, but they found that the engineers yeah. did, did get it fixed. Uh, I remember John telling me about this, and I said, are you sure? You're not exaggerating? He goes, no, I got pictures. I got pictures. Oh, yeah. This is from the cover of the book. I, I like this because you see the, the seven mile mark actually painted. Right, because like I said, throughout the years, it's 7.1, 2, 3. Yeah. On average, it was about 7.1, 7.2 was the average of how it was. Again, depending on whose car. Uh, but it's just neat seeing the actual 7 painted, and then there's a the finish. <laughs> and you'll see, this is mid-80s. I, I forget the actual year of this one, early 80s. And you can see the interest uh, of just the people spilling over everywhere. Yeah, which is terrific. And the ball field itself, after you finish, you get your, your Bill Doherty hot dogs. Um, one of the first volunteers, yeah, because he had the, I know really, he had the place at the Captain Kid, I mean at the Brothers Four, and then over, he would have the hot dogs to give to the runners, but as that grew, he created a machine that made like a thousand at a time, because just, just to get all the runners, because as the runners grew, you know, you want your traditional hot dog at a family food race. Yeah. Um, and all the volunteers, like I said, uh, you get family members or kids, you know, who would volunteer year after year and then run or go with their parents or something. So you'd see them over the years. And the water stops along the course, the hoses, all those things, which is neat. They take pride in that. The Boston Marathon, the same thing. You would see like, similar families doing that in their yards. You know? it was, it's just kind of part of the community is that with, with family. And another thing that the race does nicely, uh, like with the Boston Marathon, is they, they do recognize their past with their champions and everything at the expos, and they've done this, uh, this is the high school, but they did this at Gus Canty. Mm -hmm. And it's nice, because you know, the regular runners can meet you know, your literal Mount Rushmore of American marathoners. Uh, over here from the far left is Joan Benoit Samuelson, you know, a Hall of Famer right there, obviously. Bill Rogers right next to her, who's won Boston four times, New York four times, an Olympian, Falmouth winner. Next to him is Frank Shorter, started, basically started this whole thing. Uh, and then the youngins, uh, Ben Flanagan right there, who has won this twice in Canada. Uh, he's favorite again. Uh, and Tony Reverett, so I was telling you, who was on the media truck when the uh, tire came off. But he does the commentating. You hear him a lot at Boston and Falmouth. So they recognize a lot of these people at, at the expos, at the, the seminars. You can talk to them, very personable, uh, get your autograph, but actually just talk to them. Same with the wheelchair athletes. And you can see the difference, the, how aerodynamic it is from the original one that Bob Hall used. Um, and they recognize, which is great, I mean, here's Candace Cable, one of the early pioneers in the 70s. She's won Boston and Falmouth. Tatiana McFadden, uh, the far left, uh, more current. Uh, Craig Blanchett, who's won Falmouth more than anybody. The, the top gentleman in the red shirt on the left. Uh, well, the new crew coming in, Daniel Romanchuk. So you get generations here between the road race and the wheelchair athletes that keep coming back. They, they come back to compete as well. Um, but also to be recognized, to talk about it, to keep it alive, get the new generation interested in knowing what's going on. And with that, you have, this is very interesting, I got a kick out of this, this is Sunita Williams, uh, the astronaut um, on the International Space Station. She's tethered to this run. Uh, families in Falmouth, uh, she's run Falmouth and Boston a, a, a few times, but she had held the record for the most days in space at the International Space Station. And while she was up there, she had qualified for Boston one year. So she couldn't do it because she was 240 miles up. So she ran the Boston Marathon in the International Space Station. And she ran Falmouth, too. So when she ran Falmouth, I think this is 2012 Falmouth, uh, they piped in the audio from the start. So she could hear live 
people and everything that was going on, and they could hear her. Oh, wow. So she ran at the same time. This is way before COVID. This is technically an at-home <laughs> version of the race, only 240 miles up. So she's tethered to the treadmill. Because part of her um, responsibility as a commander of this station was uh, physical fitness. Because with no gravity, the muscle mass and bone density gets affected. So she was part of that, the training. So this photo was on the International Space Station, 240 miles in space, running found with her Boston. So I interviewed, she was at the Expo almost every year. And she's run on terra firma since. But I asked her, like, you know, what's the pros and cons of something like this? And she said, one of the great things is I'll have my bottle of water and I'll drink it and I'll just put it yeah. here. Yeah. And it'll float in front of me. I go, oh, I'd love that for a marathon. Imagine being in the Boston Marathon. Oh, yeah. She goes, however, when I sweat, Little beads of sweat are also floating. I'm like, oh, that's gross. All right, well, okay, I'll take it. And she goes, my hair gets all weird, too. I said, well, I don't have that problem. I, I, I can live with that. But I'd love to have that bottle just floating in front of you for whatever duration of the race you have. That would be great. Um, this is a six-mile mark. When Tommy died a couple of years ago, they stenciled him at every mile marker. He was on the program. So it's really nice that he's, I mean, he's just so ingrained in this, in this community with this road race. Like when I, when I wrote the book, there was so many ways to write it. I could have interviewed just the winners of every year and devoted like a page to each year and it would have been a book. But I mean, having this place like my second home, like I was saying, my godparents have lived here for decades. So I've been coming here since I was a kid. It, it really is, you can't talk about one without the other. And as you've seen with a lot of the photos, the community is so ingrained with this race that, you know, and I interviewed everyone from like Bill Doherty and the volunteers and the families and the people who play music at the ball field to the elite athletes, to the Olympians, to the race directors, the Carols and the Shermans and Tommy uh, before he passed, um, Matt Alger and Dave McGilvery and the, it just everyone because it really is so intertwined um, that this race, it's not just a race, it's not just a community, it really is together. Um, so something like that, it's, it's just, they feed off each other, which is nice. I've done enough races throughout the country in, in different countries too. And you don't get that in a lot of places. Some you do, but not, this is very unique. Um, I remember talking for the book, uh, Catherine Dureba, um, great Kenyan marathoner, won Boston a number of times, won Falmouth a number of times, one of the greatest global marathoners. And she remembers, because we have host families in Falmouth, some races do that, where a family will host the elite athlete for the week. So I'm asking her about different things about the race, and one of the first things she tells me, and this is like years later, and she's been all over the world. One of the first things she tells me is her host family taking her out to pick blueberries. She goes, I love that. She goes, we would pick uh, coffee beans at home in Kenya, so I knew how to pick. She goes, but we're picking blueberries. They made me a, a Kenyan bread. And that's like at the top of her th memories. Wow, that's we talked about the race, too, but you know what I mean? Th th that was in her heart that she knew that was, th that was just something that we were talking about. And Dina Castor, one of our great American Olympians and, and medalists, I asked her the same thing. And one of her first memories was she went to a restaurant in the center of Falmouth. I don't think it's there anymore. And uh, she walked in and told the waiter, you know, surprise me. So he brought over this big bowl of pasta with a lobster on top and cream sauce on top of the lobster. Oh and she goes, this is awesome. So he starts to walk away and she goes, excuse me, how do I eat this? And he turns around and goes like this and threw a bunch of napkins. She goes, I love that, this is great. And she walked down and got like lobster ice cream after the meal. You know what I mean? Those, those are neat little things that they, they probably remember and cherish that more than their run, because they run so many races, but they don't have that kind of connection. Yeah, it was really warming. It was nice to see that. This is actually 2020. This is the day of the Falmouth Road Race that was canceled because of COVID. Uh, that at-home version, we, I think they gave you two weeks to run the miles and you can send photos so you can stay connected to the race. It was a really great idea. A lot of races did that just to get you out of the house, just right. to do something, stay connected and stuff with community. But the actual race itself was canceled. They all were. Um, but on this day, if you, some of the locals ran anyway. I, I had to come here and see. You know, it was raining. Remember I said it was either hot or raining? <laughs> so this is the actual day of the, the, uh, that race that year. Um, and the following year when they opened it up in a limited basis, this is the high school. They, we had a little bit of an expo outside, and these are the runners lined up to go inside, put your mask on, you went to the high school, you went through whatever aisles they had, you got your number, and you had to go out the other way. There was nothing else in the high school that year. A lot of races were doing that, you know, incrementally getting back into it uh, with a reduced field and things like this. So the only expo vendors, there's about a dozen or so out front, 
and the runners had to have the mask on to go in, get your number, get out of the, of the building. You know, we were still at that stage here, but they did, they did it, which was nice to see that. Um, and I'll end with this one here. This is the, a nice aerial photo from the uh, Historical Society that, of Falmouth Heights that'll show, there's the finish line right there to give you an idea where you are. Um, the runners come from the top toward the harbor, and then they go inland around the harbor, and the 10K mark, which is 6.2 miles, is right about here when you enter Falmouth Heights. So there are the runners right there you can see between the trees. I'm not that tall. And then you come all the way around here, and then you come down here, and the Brothers Four is right up in the top here, sort of where if you see the shadow somewhere around there, where the first two years are started, uh, are finished, I mean. And then subsequently, you finish here. Now the first couple of years, like I said, with the Brothers Four, they would come out and they would go into the ball field and drinking and stuff. And Tommy didn't like that associated with the race. The police weren't too happy. Um, and the race was growing, so that's where they moved the finish line to about here, give or take. I mean, it, it moves a little bit to, get, to be adjusted. Um, and then the first few years from that, you would cross the finish line and go right into the ballpark. Well, that sort of clogged up. There's photos of Falmouth, even Boston, where you'll see runners like, standing before the finish line right. waiting to cross. They haven't finished yet. <laughs> Between it being clogged or just slow results, they're standing on the course haven't finished yet. <laughs> yeah. uh, again, not just found this. Is, you know, you're still trying to figure out how to accommodate all these people. Now what you do, which is nice, they spread you out. You finish here, and you come down mm -hmm. and sort of hook in, which is good. So it spreads it out. Also, it's good to get, get your legs as a runner. Oh, nice. Because you, you, the first thing you want to do after you stop is you sit. It's the worst thing to do, but it's a great feeling just to sit and relax. So this is kind of good to kind of get you there. Uh, to sort of relax at the ball field, then you can sort of enjoy the day. Uh, but there's also this view, uh, I'll end on these two notes, the John Carroll always joked that for the race director of a road race, he also had to clear it with the Coast Guard. And I go, what do you mean? You got me with this one. <laughs> you don't run on the water. Apparently a lot of boats would be at Woods Hole and would follow the race and like a cluster of boats. Because you can see the majority of the race from the water. It only goes inland a couple of times, you know, early on in the harbor. So they would follow it and then come out down here for the finish, but then you start to get dangerous because the swimmers, and, you know, it, it can get rough here. So they have to get a permit and, and work with them to sort of clear this area. Um, and also when the president is at Martha's Vineyard, uh, wow. for example, with Clinton, Obama was there I think seven out of his eight years. Uh, there's a 10 mile no fly zone wherever the president is. Well, the vineyard's five miles four miles. So that effect, like this photo here from a helicopter you couldn't take because you couldn't have the helicopter. All, most hotels are taken by Secret Service, all these little things you don't think of. And John was telling me once when they were putting up mile markers along the course, like surf drive and stuff, um, when the president was there, he didn't think about this, scuba divers came up oh, and started checking and go, who are you? I'm like, oh, wow. who are you? <laughs> so I'm like, how'd that go? He goes, well, you know, we, we've talked about but all these little things, when you, as, I'm a race director myself, but you don't think of that. Yeah, these neat little things. Um, and then one thing that was pretty funny along the stretch here um, is when people were, were sort of kicked out of the ball field drinking, um, they would drink on the beach, which everyone does. But the police didn't want that. Obviously, it's not good. So what some spectators used to do is they would, the night before, uh, bury kegs in the, in the beach and put little markers like a leaf or a twig. Okay. Then the next morning, they would brush off the top and they would put the tap. Remember the old days, the, the little black tap thing that we put on top of a keg? So you look down the beach, you see these dozens of just taps because all the kegs are in the sand. So the police are like, oh, okay, I got to deal with this now. So then they got smart and said, all right, for the next year, the spectators buried the kegs. The police came in afterwards that night with metal detectors, dug up the kegs. So it's like this little cat and mouse thing, and finally, I think they all gave up. <laughs> but it's like, you know, you, you got to give credit to both sides, right? <laughs> you know, a little college intuition there, getting, getting those kegs in there. And it can hold the coldness in the beach. We all know that. So, but that's a neat little, uh, I'd like this photo to end it on because it's just a neat little encapsulation. Yeah. where they've, they've all ended here, yeah. one point or another. Um, they've all started at Captain Kidd, and they've all finished here, give or take, you know, uh, adjusting and everything. Um, I know I didn't cover everything, but if anyone has any questions, you want to, yeah. This was great. I just read the book. I just read oh, thank it. you. It's fabulous. Um, what was the highest number of runners? 
Uh, about 13,000 for a number of years. 12,800. For Is that legal ones or well, they had bandits. The yeah, they had bandits in the early going. Yeah, they had bandits in the early going. Like Boston uh, had them as well, uh, but since the bombing, the race is a real because you want to know who's on the course. Uh, yeah. uh, like Boston sort of turned. I mean, you'd have all the runners and you'd you'd see the bandits waiting sort of on the street, like you know, like this. Yeah. And the officials kind of like look the other way. It does affect supplies and water. Sure. But mo most bandits, they know what they're doing. I don't want to advocate for it. Same with the Falmouth. But with Falmouth, you had, it's tough to get into Woods Hole. Yeah. So what a lot of people would do would be about a mile up and make it a 10K type thing. It still affects the, the quality of the race. Um, I don't think there's many anymore. Cause you, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't get to Woods Hole. It's just tough. It's one way in. It's, just a, it's, oh, yeah. it's like the New York City Marathon. Um, the first two miles of the New York City Marathon is the Veron's Island Narrows Bridge, right. which connects Staten Island. Well, everyone has to get over the bridge to get on Staten Island. Yeah. It's tough to be a band. Where are you going to wait on the bridge? So, like Woods Hole, it's kind of, where are you going to... We used to come down, and we had some kids in there that had fake numbers and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> We would come down Sipawissett Road. Right, you can go in the back, yeah, yeah, if you really make an effort. And stop and then walk for quite a ways. Yeah. And come around to the back. Yeah, there are back, I mean, the buses go back. When you take the official bus from Falmouth, they, they go back, they don't go through the front, like Water Street. They go through the back and dump you off. Now you're behind every, and then you walk up to your corral. There, is, there are ways to go that way, but it's so. Unless you know it, unless you're from the area. So, you know, it's not allowed to, uh, yeah. but they didn't enforce it. Yeah, yeah. It, it was most races in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it's just like, come one, come all, please pay, be nice. Mostly yeah. the fundraisers, Falmouth's nonprofit, you know, Boston. So it's like you're taking money away from What's what we're doing. Like 60 bucks? You know, I can't remember now. Yeah. It, it's high. I, I can't remember what the I'm fee Justin. is. Yeah, I can't remember what the fee has grown to. Because there's a couple of different kinds. There's one if you, if you want to go through a charity, you raise money for the charity. If you want, so there's so many now, I'm trying to, I, I can't remember. I don't want to say a wrong number. Yeah, but I can't remember. You know, I mean, the old, the old days, it was two bucks, a dollar or two dollars. And it's still a lottery. Just for fun. Yeah. It's still a lottery, yeah. Yeah, and it's still a lottery. The Falmouth residents and things, right. Yeah, that kind of thing. Which is nice to do that because you occupy in the whole area. Right. Yeah, but ever since the bombing, they really... The, the, a, the governing body really wants to know who's on the course. Um, so like with Boston, they really discourage bandits because they, like, if you do a water station or you're a volunteer, everyone knows who's on the course. So because the, the, the permits are for the course itself. So if you're on the course, if you're a runner, a volunteer, a medical tent or anything like that, they want to know. For, just for the very basics, if you get injured. Sure. You know, if you're a bandit with no number and you get injured, from a bomb or a broken leg or you pass out of a heart attack, no one knows who you are. Mm. What's your blood type? Who are you? Is this a heart attack? Are you yeah. di diabetic? No one knows. But if you have a bib number or if you're a volunteer or something, you, they know who you are. You know, so in addition to uh, other, other terrorism stuff mm. to be cleared. So uh, I don't think there's many dependents. And just the logistics of getting in the woods hole type thing. Um, and there's some races that will nail you before you get to the finish, like New York. They'll, they'll have a linebackers <laughs> take you out before you get to the finish line, too. Because no. that can throw off that, too. Oh. It can just throw off so many things. It's stuff you don't even think of. Yeah. Insurance. So there's just a million, yeah, there's a million things. It's not just jumping in and running a race like you're running in your neighborhood type thing. But, uh, but no, so, this, so in, that's what it will look like, <laughs> which is nice. A great photo from the Historical Society. Uh, any other questions? Well, I'll be here, so if you want to chat, if you think of something, again, I can sign any books that you buy. Um, but I appreciate you coming out. Thank you very much. And thank you for viewers as well.